welcome everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you for attending um, and for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Elliot Swartz. I'm a senior scientist at uh, the Good Food Institute. And I've been here for the last two years or so, really trying to deeply understand the science and technology areas uh, that will allow these cellular agricultural products to uh, be commercialized and, and to thrive. So today I've broken up the, the talk into kind of three different sections. Um, the first will focus on mainly an introduction and try to really align everyone on definitions as well as give you a picture of how cellular agriculture fits into the broader context of the alternative protein sector. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how these technologies are actually uh, made and manufactured. Uh, and the second part will go into an industry landscape that focuses mainly on, you know, who are the companies and what are they making, uh, who is investing, and, and this give you a sense of this sort of developing R&D ecosystem with a focus on cultivated meat. And then finally, I'll end with trying to address some of the kind of biggest questions that remain in cultivated meat around cost and scale, um, and talk a little bit about the remaining uh, unmet needs and opportunities um, for new businesses to, to be formed. Uh, so yeah, just an introduction to uh, the Good Food Institute. Uh, for those that don't know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit institute, entirely donor funded. And you can see our tagline at the top there is really focused on creating a sustainable, healthy, and just food system by accelerating the alternative protein industry. And we do this through several different programmatic departments. Uh, I sit on the science and technology team where we aim to understand the technological bottlenecks and mobilize the people and the projects and the funds that will address those uh, in the future. We also have a policy team that uh, aims to carve a fair path to regulation for these new products as they come on the market, as well as unlock additional funds at the state and federal levels. And then finally, we have a corporate engagement department that works with some of the largest food manufacturers and grocery stores and restaurant chains and we educate them on really what the consumers are, are asking for, as well as how to strategically implement new products on their shelves or on their menus. And then finally, we try to recapitulate this all on the international stage where we've built out teams in Brazil, Europe, India, Israel, and the Asia Pacific region. So you can learn more about us at our website there at the top. And I'd encourage you to view us as a resource in understanding more deeply about the alternative protein sector. So to jump in, uh, def just defining cellular agriculture is really, you know, generally speaking, the production of agricultural or animal products from cell cultures. And there's really two ways to go about this, where the cell cultures themselves are the products or the cells that are used can actually serve as the hosts to produce something else. And for this form, we generally refer to it as cell acellular agriculture which involves the fermentation of different forms of microorganisms like bacteria or yeast or fungi to produce another product that's used. Now there's an asterisk around agricultural because obviously not all proteins can or belong in the food system per se and can be used in other uh, ways. So for instance, silk is a you know, protein from spiders but can be used in, for a variety of different materials. But the bulk of the research is really focused on proteins, compounds, or fats that can uh, you know, basically supplement different animal products that exist in the food industry currently. And we can also think of more complex secretions like milk as being acellular products as well, as these not only contain proteins, but things like oligosaccharides and micronutrients. And so when we think about you know, the alternative protein system more broadly, we can kind of categorize these into plant-based proteins, fermentation, and animal cell culture. And we can base, and we can separate these on the basis of production, cost, and infrastructure requirements. And cellular agriculture really spans the domains of fermentation and animal cell culture. And so I'll just spend the next few slides talking more deeply about this acellular agriculture or fermentation-based process. So as mentioned, you can start from a variety of different uh, starting materials, bacteria, algae, sometimes even plant cells, I think, fall into this category now. Um, but essentially, you will ferment these cells in a bioreactor in the presence of a certain feedstock that allows those cells to grow and thrive. And the downstream product is really either the isolation and purification of all of the proteins that those cells create um, to produce a sort of powdered biomass or whole cell biomass. 
Uh, alternatively, you can use those cells as a host to express a certain protein of interest that can be either secreted or produced in such large amounts that it can be isolated and purified for its downstream purpose. And so a lot of work that goes on in these companies that work in this sector are, are working upstream on the sort of optimization of the different strains that are used as the starting material and optimizing, let's say, the amount of protein that they produce or how fast they grow, as well as the sort of downstream purification processes that are needed and that are unique to different proteins and different um, substrates. So fermentation is really central to the future of alternative proteins because not only can it serve as production of as a production platform for standalone proteins, but it also serves as a sort of enabling platform for plant-based meat and animal cell culture or cultivated meat. So for instance, enzymes that are produced through fermentation processes can improve the functionalization or coagulation properties of plant-based products like tofu. And you can also create uh, specific flavoring ingredients like soy like hemoglobin that gives the Impossible Burger its meaty taste. Uh, and then on the other side, moving towards the sort of cultivated end of the spectrum, you also have growth factors that are going to be produced by fermentation that play a key role in the cell culture media that drives the growth of those cells. And then finally, you could alternatively just produce singular proteins at a fully 100% sort of synthetic level like gelatin. And so more and more we're seeing as this kind of whole industry matures, we see more and more hybrid products being uh, created that kind of blend different segments of plant-based fermentation and cultivated methods. And we kind of expect that this trend will continue over time. So the three main uh, applications for fermentation in cellular agriculture, as mentioned before, are, is this kind of concept of creating just whole cell biomass. And, and the best examples to date are really using fungal, uh, my, the growth of fungal mycelium to produce meat replacement products. So corn is one brand that is perhaps the most recognizable because it's been around for several decades, but there are several new companies that have emerged that essentially use different fungal mycelial mycelium strains or growth parameters to create different textures and tastes that replicate different uh, cuts of meat. So this company, Emergy Food, based in Boulder, you can see creates a really uh, you know, replicable chicken product as well as a, a beefsteak product. And then Atlas Foods is using fungal mycelium to produce uh, a mycelium-based bacon product. Alternatively, uh, there are a suite of companies that are focused on using fermentation as a source of high value ingredients. So whether that's egg white proteins like Clara Foods or uh, proteins involved in milk like casein and whey, uh, collagen or soy like hemoglobin, these all serve really important functional properties in these foods and can't easily be replaced by plant-based counterparts. So even though that they serve this sort of really low volume of the overall food product, they have an irreplaceable role. And so you're, it's really vital to replace the proteins as they exist in an animal, just in this case, using uh, no animals involved. And then finally, fermentation can also be a source of processing aids. And this is really, I think, the most mature component of, of these applications. You have very large companies that focus on the industrial production of enzymes that are used not only in food processing, but also in you know, a variety of different industries. And you probably use them uh, in data in your products in your household uh, every day. So fermentation comes with you know, several clear advantages. It's a mature technology with proven scale. We know how to ferment a variety of different microorganisms on the scales of upwards of hundreds of thousands per liters uh, of liters. And that scale comes with reduced costs and economies of scale, as well as the use of relatively uh, lower kind of input materials compared to animal cell culture. And so the supply chains for feedstocks are quite robust um, and readily serve uh, mature industries already. You also have a diverse set of hosts to choose from. Uh, a wide number of different organisms are already used throughout this industry, and it serves as a, a future platform for new products to come onto market that are you kind of take advantage of unique properties of, of a wider set, a wider range of organisms. Uh, and then finally, these uh, generally have very short doubling times, which lend very well to rapid R&D and rapid production, which comes with obvious benefits compared to other methods of uh, protein production. 
So switching gears into cellular agriculture, where in this case, the production of the ag agricultural uh, products are the cells themselves. So in this case, uh, you can produce foods like a variety of meats or organs and also other products like bone or wood or different materials like leather, fur or wool. Uh, I think meats, which we'll spend the most time talking about has get garnered the most attention, but there's kind of growing industries around all of these different uh, possibilities here. Um, and I'd point people that are interested in learn, learning more about the sort of material aspect to a new organization that's uh, somewhat similar to GFI called Material Innovation Initiative, if you want to learn more about that side of the application. And just to align everyone, uh, I'll be referring to this as sort of cultivated meat. Um, it's evolved over time. Uh, but, you know, in general, this seems to be the, resonate most well with consumers as well as be so, somewhat descriptive over the overall process where we can kind of uh, can kind of uh, uh, talk about this as cultivating a product inside of a cultivator. Um, so that's just a, a layman's term for a bioreactor. So I'll be using that terminology uh, throughout the rest of the talk. So we'll talk uh, deep, more deeply about cultivated meat now. Um, so cultivated meat is genuine animal meat that can replicate the sensory and nutritional profiles of conventionally produced meat because it's essentially comprised of the same exact cell types arranged in a similar or same three-dimensional structure as animal muscle tissue. And so you can see pictured here a variety of different cultivated meat products that have been uh, prototyped and sampled and tasted from a variety of different companies across the world. But these uh, products are not yet commercially available. So to give you a, just a broad overview of how these products are produced, it, it all starts with uh, obtaining a cell biopsy or tissue biopsy. And this is generally can be performed under, under local anesthesia where, you know, the biopsy the size of, let's say, an eraser head is removed from an animal and the animal can then go living about its life. Or alternatively, you can acquire it from a recently slaughtered animal where that tissue is still viable. And nevertheless, this tissue is taken back to the lab and separated into uh, cells of interest. And in general, you want to start with a stem cell because it can not only replicate itself, but it can form into the downstream cellular components that make up meat. And so what companies will do is form a, basically a bank of cells that they can pull from uh, that will then be used in a sort of two-stage process that involves first the proliferation of cells at large scales uh, in, in a bioreactor environment where they're fed a, a cell culture medium that consists of growth factors, proteins, uh, amino acids, sugars, and vitamins and other micronutrients. Uh, and then finally, you want to eventually switch that medium formulation and the conditions, which could be in the presence or absence of a scaffolding structure, to cause those cells to differentiate into the fat, muscle, and fibroblasts or connective tissue that make up the meat. And the end goal really, or the holy grail of the industry is to be able to replicate structured products like fillets or steaks um, by just growing cells and differentiating them and structuring them in a way that replicates as if they were in an animal. So in order to really understand cultivated meat, uh, you really wanna be able to segment your thinking into four different technological areas of focus. Uh, so this is just, you know, we'll talk about this more deeply throughout, but just as an introduction to align you all uh, on the same page, we, we kind of think of cell line development as its own technology bucket, uh, where the choice of the selection of the cells dictates a lot of the considerations for the downstream bioprocess. And there's a lot of engineering and optimization that can go into the cell line development process. The cell culture medium is a main cost driver right now, and it's a complex mixture of several different components, and there's a lot of work that can be done to formulate them correctly, as well as uh, reduce the costs of the cell culture medium. And then the bioreactors and bioprocessing component involves sort of the mode of production uh, that can be selected, of which there are several different modes, and really, un and really understanding uh, uh, the bioprocess allows us to scale this industry. And then finally, the scaffold biomaterials, as well as the methods to construct those scaffoldings, uh, those scaffold structures, uh, is another big component that really allows us to produce uh, meat products that have some structure to them that are not just, uh, you know, an endless amount of chicken nuggets or sausages that come, that become commercialized, but are more high value products. So we can also think about these sorts of technology areas uh, as part of, as independent uh, parts of a larger value chain. And we can kind of think about these as uh, technology specific, 
as a technology specific value chain and a technology agnostic value chain. And so the industry right now is really highly verti vertically integrated across all of these different aspects, uh, these different technology areas along the value chain. And that makes things somewhat, quite diff somewhat difficult for companies in this space because it's really hard to innovate across all four of these areas that are really independent domains. And so we'll talk about in the next section about how there's kind of an emerging landscape of, of B2B entry points uh, along this sort of value chain, as well as um, opportunities, I think, for new innovation to happen uh, that will unlock the growth of this industry. And we'll return to this sort of bottom technology agnostic value chain at the end. I also wanted to just, you know, for illustrative purposes, it's, it's nice to map on the sort of technology specific components across the alternative uh, protein spectrum, where you can see the sorts of analogous uh, roles of technology in, in the selection of crops and optimization of crops, of host strain development and engineering and of cell line development across these domains. That's all really talking about the same thing. Similarly, you have the cell culture media and the feedstock that's involved in, in the fermentation processes that involves a lot of the same raw material inputs um, that will be used throughout these industries. And then finally, the bioprocess design is somewhat similar and analogous across cultivated meat and fermentation as well. So just another way to think about this is segmenting it, uh, the value chain in three different buckets, uh, thinking about the upstream aspects, the manufacturing aspects, and the distribution aspects. Um, and so obviously there are not really any products commercialized in the uh, cultivated meat sector. So we'll spend the bulk of the today talking about this sort of middle ground area about how the investments flow to drive R&D around the different upstream and manufacturing components of cultivated meat and talk about how that really unlocks uh, the, the scaling of the industry and lowering the costs of the industry as it matures. So I don't have too much else to say about this slide, but I think this uh, is, is illustrative um, of how we kind of think about the industry along different segments of the value chain. So with that, I'll end uh, section one and, oh, sorry, I'll just summarize actually the key points here first. Um, just some takeaway points for this section. Uh, cell ag really spans the alternative protein domains of cultivated meat and fermentation. And it's best, and fermentation is best thought of this as an enabling technology for alternative proteins. So it can serve as this production platform for whole cell bi biomass or for high value ingredients and processing aids. And then finally, uh, we'll discover that cultivated meat is, is some, somewhat of a more complex task involving multiple different technology areas of focus to recreate actual animal meat products.